Thanks very much, Tom, and uh, for putting on a great program. I'm, it's a privilege to be a part of this. I've been involved in the uh, Hughes program since its inception, and uh, probably like uh, most of the people here, I was really very ignorant about the electrosurgical principles until I got involved in uh, Fuse. So m really my only relevant uh, disclosure is that I was on the Fuse task force uh, and committee uh, for the first uh, three years or so. So um, operating room fires are rare, fortunately, but potentially devastating. Now the ECRI, which is a patient safety uh, research uh, foundation, estimates that there are anywhere from 200 to 240 OR fire cases uh, per year. Um, and those are probably legitimate OR fires in which there was some potential injury. That's similar to the number of wrong site surgery cases uh, in the U.S. Now, fortunately, the vast majority of these are minor and uh, result in no or minimal injury. But there are 20 to 30 that are serious with potentially disfiguring or uh, disabling injuries. So I'm just going to start with a case report. Um, this was probably about four years back. It was at one of our affiliated hospitals. It's a 65-year-old man who underwent, was undergoing excision of an epidermal inclusion cyst on his uh, forehead under local anesthesia with sedation, something that you could possibly have just done in the office. He was uh, prepped with a, a chloroprep, an alcohol-based prep. Um, he was administered oxygen by nasal cannula. He was draped with cloth towels and a full drape over that. There was an elliptical incision made around the cyst, and as the ellipse was deepened around the inferior aspect of the wound with the Bowie or electrosurgical monopolar pencil, there was a spark observed in the field and a flash beneath the drapes. So this was immediately uh, smothered and the drapes were pulled off, but the patient was burned across the cheeks and nasal bridge, superficial second degree burns transferred to a burn unit for further care. Some of you may have seen uh, this case. This was on the NBC Today show uh, six years ago. And it was a case of a young woman who was under, undergoing uh, a mole excision on the face, and there was an OR fire, and uh, this is what happened to her. Now, I'm going to try to play uh, this video. The Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation uh, has a video uh, on their website, which you can download and watch. I would encourage you to do that. This is a uh, a, uh, uh, a section from that, and SAGES uh, has uh, been working on producing an OR fire safety video that will be out later this year. I want to make sure that we have audio uh, to play. on the neck that's being taken off. So this uh, video, I've watched it several times, it still gets my heart rate up a little bit uh, when I see it. And I think what it illustrates is how quickly this can happen uh, with uh, potentially devastating consequences. Now, um, this has been one of the uh, sentinel events uh, for the uh, Joint uh, Commission, and it's one of the top uh, priority safety topics that's been identified by the ARN uh, Presidential Commission on uh, Patient Safety. So awareness about this has uh, been out there for a while. Uh, the FDA was having an annual uh, fire prevention week and doing safety, and that's now been turned over to the uh, Joint Commission and the Council on Surgical and Perioperative Safety. So you can find information about this on that uh, website. And I can guarantee you that the, uh, the trial attorneys are aware of this. And this is a, um, from a website uh, from uh, a, an attorney who uh, specializes in this area and is even uh, written a book on fire in the operating room, a preventable uh, tragedy. And uh, they have the knowledge and experience to help victims of surgical fires anywhere in the U.S. This is one of those events like wrong site surgery. It's hard to explain, to justify, and if it happens, uh, there's almost certainly going to be uh, some type of a settlement that'll occur. 
So let's, let's try to understand a little bit what are the elements uh, that create the condition in which an OR fire can occur, because this is all about prevention, not treatment. So um, there's something known as the fire triangle. There are three elements that are required to generate conditions to have a fire. First of all, you've got to have a heat source. We certainly have plenty of those in the operating room, primarily the electrosurgical unit, but lasers can do it too. You have to have fuel. We've got plenty of that as well. Drapes, alcohol-based preps, which we've almost all gone to exclusively now. And you need an oxidizer, oxygen or nitrous oxide. And so because uh, these elements aren't controlled all by one single individual in the OR, it really requires coordination by the team in order to prevent this from happening. Now here are some of the demographics about OR fires. So uh, about 21% uh, occur in the airway from procedures in the oral cavity, 44% around the head, neck, face, or upper chest, probably in large part because that's where the oxygen source is most concentrated. The vast majority uh, of the ignition sources are from the electrosurgical equipment, about 10% are lasers, and the others, various other things, uh, primarily the fiber optic uh, light uh, cable. So this is a, um, uh, a one-page uh, document from the ECRI Institute. Only you can prevent surgical fires. It talks about issues of surgical team communication and understanding the risk factors and various other things, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. So what are the, some of the things that we can do? One is to minimize the use of an open oxygen source. And what we mean by that is uh, oxygen mask or nasal cannula. And that is especially critical if you're doing a procedure around the head and neck region, okay? Um, at a minimum, the oxygen concentration should be less than 30%. And if you're doing a tracheostomy or any procedure on the wear airway, you need to use a cold uh, instrument to cut the tracheal rings and to the enter the airway. Um, Alcohol-based preps, you need to allow these to dry before draping. We have a three-minute rule in our operating room, and we do it by the clock. And we don't drape until that three minutes has passed. And the other thing about an alcohol-based uh, fire is that it's a blue flame, and it's hard to see. So you can have more extensive damage before you actually recognize, potentially, what's going on. Since we're all uh, laparoscopic surgeons, we use these uh, light uh, uh, cables all the time. This unit should always be on standby before it's uh, connected to the laparoscope. And the light source should always be turned off before it's disconnected at the end of the case. I, we, I usually have a medical student that's handling the laparoscope. And uh, we have to be vigilant about making sure that they understand it and this is adhered to, because it takes about three to four seconds uh, for this light cable to be in contact with the drape before you start to get a burn uh, that begins. This is a patient actually from uh, our institution. It was an ENT case. Um, and uh, again, a fiber optic light cable burn on the patient's face uh, because these precautions weren't followed. <coughs> So some of the preventive uh, measures that we can undertake when using electrosurgery, be aware of the open oxygen source. You've got to integrate that into your team discussion at the beginning. And one of the problems about the open source, you have drapes around the head and neck area. You can have relatively areas of pooling of higher oxygen concentration that can, that, that can uh, help uh, trigger the fire. You only want to activate your electrosurgical unit when the tip is in view and deactivate it before it leaves the surgical site. One of my pet peeves, particularly with our trainees, is putting an electrosurgical device in the holster when it's not in use. In fact, a lot of times the scrub nurse will put the holster away and doesn't even keep it out for you to put it in. But how many times have you had a trainee just put the unit down on the patient's bare skin? And if somebody leans on that, you can get a burn. And you don't ever want to use uh, rubber, slo rubber sleeves over the electrosurgical uh, electrodes. I don't think anybody really does that much anymore, but that's also an additional risk. So um, you should be aware of uh, heightened risk factors. So we incorporate, a t uh, as a part of our uh, timeout before we make the cut, uh, the fire risk hazards. And so the things that will get you are if you're doing surgery above the xiphoid, if there's an open oxygen delivery source, and you've got an ignition source. So any procedures in that area, you really have to be very careful and communicate and make sure you're following the principles about how that open oxygen source is administered. So what happened, what do you do if uh, the disastrous event of an OR fire occurs? 
So the first thing is you need to stop the flow of all airway gases to the patient. Um, that is especially important if it is an airway fire. You've got to disconnect the breathing circuit. If you just pull the endotracheal tube out, let's say you were doing a tracheostomy, then it acts like a blowtorch. Uh, so you have, to, you have to disconnect the flow of gases first uh, before you remove the endotracheal tube. If it's an airway fire, uh, you want to remove the tube and then pour saline into the airway. Number two, immediately remove any and all burning and burned materials from the patient, whether it's on or in the patient. You've got to get those out uh, immediately. Number three, extinguish the fire on burning materials. Uh, it's usually not necessary to use a CO2 fire extinguisher, but as you saw in that video, it, it was used to be, just to be sure that those uh, drapes didn't uh, reignite. And then the final thing is, once you've done all of that, then care for the patient, which means restoring the breathing, always using room air, never oxygen, and assess and manage uh, the patient injuries. Now, uh, extreme OR fires are, ex are very rare. And there's an acronym for how you should manage this in the event that this will occur. It's the RACE act act acronym. Rescue, uh, alert, confine, and evacuate. So you want to uh, rescue the patient uh, from the fire and the OR. Alert the nearby staff, activate the fire alarm systems, call the fire department. Confine and isolate the room, means closing the doors, shutting off the gas valves, uh, smoke evacs, all the electric power to the room, and then evacuate the room, and if necessary, uh, the entire surgical suite. That's extremely rare. There are only two known cases of that uh, that's happened. So <clears throat> it's up to us to impact this. It's about awareness. It's about communication with the team. It's about paying attention to all of these uh, risk factors. Um, if you are connected through social media, tweet somebody about fire safety. Uh, find out uh, what policies and practices are in place at your institution. Take those back. Communicate to them. Talk to your colleagues about the importance of this and the fire risk assessment. Uh, talk about it during staff meetings. Think about doing maybe an in-service on this topic. I, I have uh, this OR fire uh, talk that I give. I'm happy to share that with any of you. Uh, if you would uh, like to go back home and give a talk about OR fire safety, I'm doing a grand rounds for our uh, surgical uh, nursing staff uh, in the OR this coming week about uh, safe energy use in the operating room. This is one of the things I'm going to talk about. That's a great opportunity to go back, get engagement, because I guarantee you there'll be buy-in from the staff. And things can happen you can't imagine. The last fire that was in the OR at our institution, they were um, hooking up a device to blow CO2 uh, into a wound, for it was in a cardiothoracic case, and the connection was inadvertently hooked up to the oxygen instead of the CO2. Uh, fortunately, uh, there was no significant harm that took place to the patient, but there are things that you cannot you know, possibly uh, suspect that can happen that can potentially lead to this. Um, there are a lot of resources out there. The ARN has a, has a, a statement on this. Um, the uh, Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, of course, uh, Sir Sa Sage is in the uh, FUSE site. And so it's up to us uh, to prevent this from happening. And with that, uh, I'll conclude and be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.